How's it going ladies and gentlemen, Data here and welcome back to episode number two of our brand new Vancouver Canucks franchise mode here on NHL 24. Here in our first season with the Canucks in this second episode we're moving into the second half of year number one, the 2023-24 season. In the last one we started to put our stamp on this Vancouver Canucks franchise here in the GM Data era. First and foremost making a big deal with the LA Kings where we acquired players to fill the two biggest holes on this team. Number one as our new second line center, Philip Dano. On the LA Kings overall wise in EA land, they have Byfield, they have Kopitar, they have Dubois. Not a lot of room for Dano who is playing third line plus second unit power play. Here in Vancouver he's playing second line, second power play, first penalty kill and although the plus minus has been bad due to the chemistry unfortunately, he has been putting up solid numbers. The other position that we fill is over on the right side D as we also acquired Matt Waugh from the LA Kings. 10 assists and a plus 1 through 41 games on pace to score 20 points. Not too shabby on, I would say, a lesser Vancouver Canucks team. I think that he's also been a victim of some struggles in the first half. And we also picked up Alex Edler in free agency, former Canuck, former third round pick in 2004. We brought him back to Vancouver and it's great to see that he'll be getting closer and closer, hopefully fingers crossed, to playing his thousandth game as a Canuck. Aside from that, the team has has been doing their best. We started off pretty slow, I do have to say, but our record currently sits at 23, 17, and 1, which is, as you can see, good enough to put us atop the Pacific Division. Now, it's very tight in the Pacific, as the Oilers are one point behind, the Kings are one point behind, both with like four games in hand, the Flames are right there five points behind, the Golden Knights six points behind, so the Pacific is still going to be tight, but to say that we're on pace to win 46 games, no, that's not horrible. Points-wise, we see Kuzmenko currently on pace to score 84 points. He's leading the way for our team. Elias Pettersson on pace for 40 goals and not quite point per game, but he's hovering around there. A slow start and a strong second quarter. Hopefully that end to the first half can be the beginning of our second half. Brock Besser on pace for 68 points. That would be great. Dano, Miller, Heronic, incredible on pace for over 50 points, 52 to be precise. Quinn Hughes hasn't quite put the numbers that we would hope from him, but still a lot of time to improve. But one player who has really been struggling is Ilya Mikhaev. 10 goals, 14 points, negative 14 on the season so far. On pace to score 20 goals and 28 points with a negative 28. So being paid, what, 4.75 million? I'm not sure if he's really working out as that third line presence for us right now. Our middle six, our bottom six hasn't been great. Our scoring at the top has been okay, but our depth scoring has been struggling. And our defense in general, Tyler Myers, negative nine. Uh, Edler, negative five, isn't horrible. At negative nine really stands out to me. Quinn Hughes on the top pair, negative six. That's frustrating. Maybe moving Hronik around. We'll see what we can do. And goaltending, Thatcher Demko is doing his best. 17, 14, and one with three shutouts. 909 save percentage and 3.03 goals against average. But Casey DeSmith, despite the six and six record, has a 924 save percentage and 2.44 goals against average. So hats off to you, Casey. Keep it up, buddy. That's a little recap of what we've been doing so far in our first 41 games at the helm of the Vancouver Canucks. 41 games to go and we're in a tough spot as we're going to see in the comments in just a minute there are some people who are saying we shouldn't be buying at all we're lucky to be where we are our numbers are inflated we're likely not going to be making the postseason let's just be conservative meanwhile there's other people who are commenting listen that may be the case but we could consider buying if we want Elias Pettersson to really be convinced to stay here we got to show that we're willing to make a push for the postseason so I do think that our answer in this episode will be a mix of those two approaches. I do have some moves in mind that I think will improve the team that I've done a little pre-scouting on. So I'll get to those in a moment, but first and foremost, let's get to the comments from the assistant general managers. So we'll start it off with Super Loser who commented, Hey Data, great episode as always. As a fan of the Sabres, I wish nothing but the best for our 1970 brothers in futility. Very nice of you to say. My thoughts on the team. This is not a team worth going in on. They are too top heavy and have had glaring consistency issues through the first half of the season. I would not make a move to acquire any veterans. We're thinking guys like David Perron, a few, even Max Pacioretty. 
Any moves made would be to acquire picks and prospects. Mikhaev should 100% be moved. He's looked awful, and he's blocking younger players that still have room to grow, like Hoaglander and Pudkolzin, from getting more ice time. Also, if the team goes on another skid and the playoffs don't look like a lock, we should consider moving those young guys into our top six. They'll probably see more growth playing next to Pedersen and Kuzmenko than next to Beauvillier and Bluger. This may seem like it would hurt Pedersen's chances of resigning, but we should consider that the problem with the last regime he's been under, or the last regimes that he's been under, has been that they have consistently sold future assets for veterans and then have had it blow up in their face, namely the OEL deal. If we buy at the deadline and miss, that may be the final straw for, uh, for Pedersen. Sticking to developing our younger players may be a welcome change of pace for him, even if we don't make the postseason. That's all from me. Interesting position to be in, but I'm sure you'll have no problem navigating it. Good luck and go Canucks. Thank you for those kind words, Super Loser. We'll keep it in mind as we move to the next comment. As Cheating Heels says, it looks like we might need to shake things up some more. This is a 500 team at best, and I'm not really sure how we're first in our division. Mikhaev is pulling everybody down. We should get rid of him and give extra ice time to Pudkolzin and Hoaglander if we want them to develop. Pudkolzin should be better than what he's showing. He currently has two goals and one assist through 39 games, so I couldn't agree more. Would Dallas be crazy enough to make a deal there? Stan Coven? You know, or maybe just ship him out for picks, Mikhaev. So that's a couple things to consider there. On defense, with Tyler Myers being atrocious and not coming back next year and not knowing if we'll bring uh, Matt Waugh back as he wants like about $5 million, we should also really look into trading for Adam Boquist. As a low elite player, his value is quite low and he could be a top four right D, the top four right D that we're looking for. Putting him with Hughes on the first power play unit could boost his stats and turn him into an elite player if we're lucky. In any case, I doubt he's worse than Myers, who can sit as 7th D. I don't disagree with that at all. It's just that, as I'll be showing you in a little bit, trade value is really dry right now. So, essentially, we shouldn't be trading or wasting assets to get mid-30-year-old players like Perron right now, as we're far from being contenders. For extension thoughts, Cheating Heel says definitely extend Heronic as his demand is very reasonable. Pedersen, there's a couple storylines we could go with there, but we'll think about him more likely in the offseason. And for Beauvillier, he's looked better, but ideally he's a third liner that we wouldn't go more than around $2.5 million on, so we'll see there. There is still a world of hurt ahead of us before we can be considered a contender. Let's spend cautiously. Go Nux. Thank you, Cheating Heel. So with those first two YouTube comments in mind, I'm now going to hop over to the Discord server where Cade says, I noticed a good bit of comments on YouTube saying to not be buyers for the Canucks series, but I'm kind of on the side of being conservative buyers with the current pace the team is on. You know, we're like, I think it's 7-2-1 and one in the last 10. With some bottom six help and maybe another piece on D, the team should be able to make the playoffs and maybe even have a decent run, especially if the goalies hold up and Hughes starts getting on track. I think getting Pedersen to the playoffs would go further in getting him to agree to a long-term extension, but we could still think about that one-year thing. We still have leverage, RFA, more storylines for later. I would say that round four picks and above and the current players being discussed are fair game for trade negotiations to bolster the team and would look at the guys on the Kraken with expiring deals since their record is bad. Cade, thank you for those thoughts, my friend. Now with those first three comments in mind, I move over to Rock and Pop back on YouTube, who says kind of what I was thinking in terms of like a compromise between those two viewpoints. Rock and Pop says, I think that Pacioretty and or Kessel, who's a free agent, Kessel is, could be good additions for cheap cost to help to push for the postseason position. I would also say to maybe look at trading Mikhaev to acquire younger pieces, prospects, whatever it would be. As always in EA land, you never know if they're gonna grow or what, but at least we'll do our best. Maybe acquiring someone who would be a good fit for the coaching style to help stabilize for the plus minus. That would be a great addition as well, as that's somewhere we've been struggling. And leading from Rock and Pop, Zach says, I think move on from Mikhaev already. You should also sign Kessel. The team is struggling with depth scoring and he could help with that. Kessel has also stated that he doesn't really care what team he plays with. I think maybe even signing Comtois as an extra forward could be interesting. See how he works on the fourth line. The lines could look something like this. So here's some ideas with the power play unit, then having put Colson on it so that he would have some ice time. But that would keep him on the fourth uh, even strength line, which would not be ideal. So all these thoughts in mind, thank you to all the assistant general managers who left their thoughts. 
I do think that I formulated a bit of a plan that allows us to recoup some value now, not necessarily go all in, but still get a little bit better without moving out trade value. So number one move that we have to make, I think in the second half of the season is to move out Ilya Mikhaev. Ilya Mikhaev is not a player that I was thinking we'd have to move on from. He signed for three more years at 4.75 million. He has a 12 team, no trade list. I didn't think that we were gonna be moving him, but he's on a really bad pace 14 points and negative 14 through 41 games on pace to score 28 points which is what he scored last year in the real world in 46 games he scored 32 and 53 in toronto with 21 goals so that is very frustrating he's a very fast player he has solid enough defensive attributes for a two-way forward he's a good shooter with a high shooting percentage as well i didn't necessarily want to move him but to send a message to the team that not that we're going all in but we're looking to make this team as strong as it can possibly be with what we're given I think it would go a long way to move out his contract and bring in, even if it's not someone else who's going to help us as much, just to bring in someone like Hoaglander from the fourth line to just have more ice time in the top nine and allow him to develop into a better player rather than be buried for a guy that we're hoping gets back to his form but has not really been showing us anything. So that being said, I think moving out Mikhaev would be our like first order of business. If I go to the trade finder and I look for trades, there are a good number that come up and there are some teams that are certainly interested in Ilya Mikhaev. A contending team would like to have a player like him, I'm sure, if they have the money for it and they want to try and recapture what he's done in the past and get him off of Vancouver, I could see him being moved for the value that the teams are offering a second, a third, something like that. The Hurricanes, I did do a little pre-scouting. I didn't do any trades yet, obviously, as you can see, but I did do some pre-scouting. The Hurricanes are offering a second next year and a third this year. That is the best offer. Other teams have a second and something else. Tyson Barry is definitely interesting from Nashville. As a right-handed D, I'm sure people are gonna be interested in that but I'm not sure if I want to go so offensive to have Hughes and Hironic and like a Barry or a Boquist and then only like Carson Soucy as the other defenseman there, uh, like defensive defenseman in the top four. I don't know. Plus, Matt Roy isn't gone just yet. If we still needed to fill that right D spot, I would say, yes, let's go and just, even if it's more offensive, we need a better player than than uh, Tyler Myers. But we have Matt Roy. He's been good enough. I'm going to let him continue to prove himself first. So that being said, there's the Hurricanes do have the best offer. Now, Ilya Mikhaev has a 12-team no-trade list. So oftentimes what I'll do is just the bottom 12 teams in the league will be on that list. Unfortunately, I can't really go inside Mikhaev's head and decide for him. Maybe the bottom 10 teams plus the Coyotes and another, like, I don't know, some West Coast team that's something that, that you wouldn't want to be on. So the bottom 12 in the league, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 right there, the Bruins. The Hurricanes are currently in 13th. They're in a wild card spot. They're a winning team. They're a very good team as well. I could see Mikhaev being a good fit with the Hurricanes, actually, just thinking about players who fit where. I think Mikhaev could be a player who fits with the Hurricanes system. So if we're to go back to the trade screen here and go to see the Hurricanes, they're willing to give us a third this season and a second next season, which would be great because this season, I wouldn't mind another third with having no second. And next year in 2025, we have no second. So we get back a second round pick in 2025, which is exactly what we want. We get another third now in the 2024 draft and we trade Ilya Mikhaev. But I looked a little bit deeper. I went into the player search and I said, are there any defensemen in the NHL who have minimum, let's say like 86 shot blocking, minimum 86 stick checking, and they're not too high of an overall and not costing a lot of money? One player who popped up over on the Hurricanes is Jalen Chatfield. Chatfield is an 80 overall, 27 years of age, defensive defenseman, 87 shot blocking, 90 stick checking, signed at league minimum for on an expiring deal, 13 games this season, three assists, even plus minus, no other simulation numbers to show aside from that. In the real world, he was solid last season, 14 points and a plus 23. So Jalen Chatfield could be exactly what the doctor ordered for that third pair right D, and Tyler Myers can kind of rotate in and out of the lineup, but Chatfield being there makes me feel a lot more confident. He's not gonna be the anchor, but to have 90 stick checking, 87 shot blocking, and, get, and be able to acquire him for very cheap, that would be something that interests me very much. So Mikhaev to the Hurricanes for 
a second and a third. They already offered us that, so we know they would go through. Can I just add in chat field and make this trade happen? It is rejected. So we know for a second and a third it would go through because that's what the trade finder told us. We'd have to add value on our side, and I really don't want to do that. So I did also think of this as kind of like a contingency plan. If we were to move out someone else that the Hurricanes are interested in, sorry, skaters matching the block, and we sort by overall, I wouldn't mind giving up like a suitor or a bluger. Uh, do they want, yeah, they do want Suter, they do want Bluger. Bluger signed at 1.9 million. Suter has term as well at 1.6. So you know what, I think Teddy Bluger could be a good toss in here. Seven points, negative one. He hasn't been horrible, but for, especially for what he is and, his, and the ice time that he has, but I don't think we'd keep him beyond this season most likely. So if we trade out Teddy Bluger with Mikhaev to the Hurricanes for a second and a third and Chatfield, the value's a little bit in our favor now. Could I get something back from you now in Carolina? Can I get another sixth on top of this now? 2024 sixth. What do you say to this? Not interested. Oh, they don't want two players that fill the same thing. But the value's there. It's because they're in the same trade. What about seventh? Uh, reject. Okay, you know what? Watch this. This is this is GM franchise mode 101. Because they'd be acquiring Mikhaev and Bluger in the same deal, they don't want to do it. So watch this. I'm going to do Mikhaev to the Hurricanes for a second and a third. They can afford him. They want him. They're buyers. Let's do it. Mikhaev, so long, buddy. Thank you for your service here in Vancouver, your short tenure with the Vancouver Canucks. We wish you all the best in Carolina. And now we will recoup a second and a third, which is much more than I thought we were going to get for him. We saw most other teams weren't offering that high. The Hurricanes were willing to do it. Now what we can do, after I edit the lines for a second is go back to the Hurricanes again and say, now I will trade you Teddy Bluger in exchange for Jalen Chatfield and a pick. Let's say, I don't know, like a fifth round pick. What do you say to this, Carolina? Chatfield and a fifth. Reject Sweden and just a touch. So Chatfield and a sixth, there you go, they'll accept this. So they wouldn't do it in the Mikhaev trade, but if I do it separately, Bluger for Chatfield and a sixth, that they would do. So a little franchise mode trick for you, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so Teddy Bluger, thank you for your time here in Vancouver. More just a casualty of necessity more than anything. I didn't mind keeping him, but if moving him out gets me some more stability on defense, then that's what I'm gonna do. So Studnika can come into the lineup now, and that leaves us with an empty forward spot. Hoaglander can move up to the third line, which is exactly what we wanted to see. Third line center can now be Pia Suter. Studnika com can come in full time in the lineup now as fourth line center. And fourth line right wing, wait for it, can be Phil the Thrill Kessel. Now we could go out and make some sort of trade using some of our picks to try and acquire a veteran, but then he has to come into the top six, top nine, who gets bumped back down. So that could be a possibility, but I don't wanna move out more trade value. If we can get Phil the Thrill Kessel now, in January of 2024, he's still unsigned, he wants to play, he doesn't mind where he's going. Actually, there's a team interested in signing Max Comtois, really? The Blackhawks are. Okay, so it looks like the Blackhawks are in negotiations with Comtois, but Phil Kessel still out here, still available, unsigned. He wants to play fourth line depth scoring. That's where we've been struggling a little bit. Our depth scoring has not been there. Phil Kessel, he's 36. He's got the four star shooting, not horrible on the 86 stick checking and all that. He brings a veteran presence. He's great for the locker room. Maybe throw him on the power play if he starts showing us that he can still do it down on the fourth line. I see this as like a zero risk kind of move. He fills a roster spot and it doesn't cost us anything. So Phil Kessel, one year, one million, signing in January, 2024. Let's see what you say about that, buddy. Hopefully he signs ASAP and we can get him into the lineup uh, on the fourth line. So I'm gonna advance a couple days. Hopefully he signs before the game against the Penguins. What a game to come back in Pittsburgh. And he does. I was extremely happy to accept your offer. Your cash offer was most generous and it really was quite easy to make up my mind about your offer. Phil Kessel, welcome back to the NHL, my friend. That Ironman streak will be continued. So I'm gonna make a few changes now. Let's get Hoaglander and Podkolzin on the power play. Let's get Kessel on the fourth line. Let's get Chatfield in the lineup. And this is how we're gonna look.
and here you have it. So let me take you through some of the changes that I made. Phil Kessel doesn't really have a great fit anywhere in the lineup aside from the first line. He doesn't bring the line down, but you know, a lot of dashes, you know, well, it evens out when you have the X's and the check marks. Fourth line right wing with Pia Suter and Sam Lafferty as the other line mates on the fourth line. I want to get Studnika on the third line. Studnika has played some, well, five games on the fourth line, playing under eight minutes per night. This is a coach who rotates three lines. He has low top six potential. If he's ever going to grow any higher than a 78, even to 79, even to 80, he needs some ice time. So Suter has special teams. He has some, some penalty kill. I don't mind putting him as fourth line center. So that's Dunika, Hoaglander, and Podkolzin can all try and get growth as a plus two on that, on that third line. So we'll try rolling like that. Over on defense, we're going to try Susie and Chatfield on the third pair. They get a plus one. Now, if Edler swaps, it goes plus one, negative one, zero, plus one like this. If we make Susie and Chatfield the second pair, they get a plus two in that top four. So we might go to that. But to just ease Chatfield into it, he'll get a plus one with Susie on the third pair. And we'll see what happens from there. As of now, Pullman and Myers will both be healthy scratches. On the power play, I essentially decided to swap put Colson and Hoaglander from their special teams unit so instead of put Colson on third unit penalty and Hoaglander on second unit power play I swap them around but Colson will get the second unit power play time and Hoaglander will get the third unit penalty kill time because Hoaglander was playing 10 20 while put Colson with that penalty kill time was playing 12 22 so hopefully the ice time can come back down to even a little bit and with the power play minutes, but Colson can find a little bit of offense because two goals and one assist in 39 games is definitely unacceptable. So we'll try this as our lineup, ladies and gentlemen. The top six won't change just yet. Beauvillier doesn't have a good fit on that second line. I prefer to have him on the third. It maintains the plus two. So if put Colson or Hoaglander or even Studnika, if they could show, even uh, Phil Kessel, if they could show that they're doing great in their positions in the bottom six, a promotion to Beauvillier's spot on the second line line wouldn't be out of the question. So the lineup changes have been made. I think this is the squad we're going to be rolling forward with. We made a couple of changes so that we're not saying we're going in as buyers. We're not selling in the future so as to get pieces for a run now, but we are bringing in some helpful pieces in Kessel and in Chatfield. We're moving out pieces that weren't helping us in Mikhaev and not so much in Bluger. We take back picks as a contingency and we continue to move forward as the current top team in the Pacific Division. So that's enough talk talking, that's enough management. All that being said, let's head over to PPG Paints Arena to face the last team that we had in NHL 23, the Pittsburgh Penguins. Of course, the team that we had Phil Kessel on, we retired his number 81 with the Penguins. It was a great time. And now Phil comes back to the NHL at PPG Paints Arena. You couldn't make a better storyline than that. First period, 2-0 Penguins early. Malkin and Crosby scoring in the first period. They're a high scoring team. Second period, come on boys, there we go, get one, Beauvillier and that even strength on that second line, there you go, he heard us talking about his second line spot. Shots are 22-18 to 18 for the Penguins and we're down by one headed into the third period. I'd love to see a top six goal, another one of those top six goals, as well as the third line getting in on offense, that would be great. The shots are getting a bit more even and there's Jake Gensel making it 3-1, to one. I almost got excited for the Penguins, just force of habit. Two goal lead now for the Penguins that may be insurmountable as we're not, we're not really getting anything going in the final couple minutes here. And Noel Cherry adds an empty netter as we lose 4-1 to one in Phil's comeback game. Shots end 36-23. to 23. We were not getting enough shots on net in that one. Let's check out the plus minuses. Negative 2 for Beauvillier despite scoring a goal. Uh, Dano, Edler, Roy, all negative 2s. Hughes, put Coles in, Lafferty, Chatfield, Suter, Studnika are the only zeros out there. Fourth line barely played, honestly, so a lot of ice time for Pat Colson. He had over 15 minutes. Tough 4-1 loss, but good to see that at least the players we just got and promoted didn't really have the worst uh, plus-minus nights there. Let's keep on simulating a little bit in the calendar. And I guess let's go up to the All-Star break. Why not? Let's do another couple of weeks, and we'll see where we're standing at that point. A little road trip finishing off here. 4-3 win on the road against the Sabres. 3-2 win. 8-3 win. Okay. All right. 3-2 win. Then we get stopped by a 4-3 loss. And we bounce right back with a 5-2 win. Oh. Okay, nice little stretch right there. So since we've made those changes, we are 5-2-0 and oh in the last seven games, including a four-game winning streak. Okay. So here at home to host the Blue Jackets, we're 28-19-1. Last game before the All-Star break here at the end of January. 
First period, one nothing. Kuzmenko leading our team, I would believe, still. 14-7 to are the shots, doubling in our favor. Second period, 1-1, one, one, as Bemstrom ties it up on Casey to Smith. Shots 26-17, to headed into the third period, all tied up into the final 20 minutes now. I hope that third line's been doing well. I'm looking forward to seeing their stats. It's This is now the eighth game since we've made those changes. No scoring through the first half of the third period. We're definitely leading the shots, but we're down to the final five, still all tied up. Fill the thrill, Kessel! Puts us up 2-1. to one. Could that be enough? And yes, it will be. Phil Kessel scores the game-winning goal to give us the 2-1 victory. Shots end 38-25. to 25, And we come out with a big regulation victory. Phil the Thrill Kessel. Third star honors. Kuzmenko goal and an assist. DeSmith with a huge 24 save performance. The hot dogs are on us tonight. Whenever Phil scores a goal, it's free hot dogs the next day throughout Vancouver. Di Giuseppe, injured arm, head coach can replace him. And that's a great way to head into the All-Star break, still sitting atop the Pacific Division. Now, let's go see Mikhaev and the Hurricanes in Carolina as our next game as we sim through the All-Star break. Di Giuseppe is back in the AHL. All right, and here we now are, 29-19-1, and one, looking for win number 30 in Carolina. The Hurricanes, not... You know they're above 500, but not looking convincingly as a you know as a super strong team. They're going to definitely want to get a win here against a team that they acquired Mikhaev from. Revenge game here. First period, one nothing Vancouver. It's Brock Besser on Kachetkov to open up the scoring. Second period, two one as Besser scores his second of the night, coming on the power play. Then Shveshnikov answered soon after. Shots almost double in our favor, 28 to 15. We're up two to one. Power play Canucks, but Seth Jarvis scores just as it expires. Another power play for Vancouver. Now that one's killed off. 2-2 game, and now it's 3-2 as Mikhaev puts the Hurricanes at, but Hoaglander comes right back in that third line, but Quinn Hughes scores what is probably like his second goal of the, actually, yes, it is. It's his second goal of the season. The captain comes through at a great time, but then Ahu ties it up again, 4-4. Oh, what a roller coaster in this third period. Mikhaev puts the Hurricanes ahead. Hoaglander, who took his spot as third line left wing, ties it up. The captain puts us ahead, but then Aho makes it a 4 4 game headed into overtime. Shots are 34 to 30, but we take the victory thanks to Elias Pettersson. 5 4 Canucks the final. Shots end 35 to 30. What a comeback! 5-4, what a game, up and down all the way. Veronic three assists to get first start honors. Aho and Pedersen both with a goal and an assist there. Whew, all right, what a game to get. Win number 30, love to see it. Let's go see, let's just sim a you know, good little chunk. Maybe the Kings actually. Yeah, the first time that we've seen the Kings all year. We've, we're yet to see the Kings. 3-1 loss against the Bruins, 4-2 win, 4-2 loss, 3-2 win, 2 nothing loss, 4-2 loss, 3 nothing shutout victory, Ian Cole. Now the, the calendar is flying. 4-3 shootout loss, 4-2 win, just our second loss beyond regulation there as we lost in the shootout. Back to it, and then a 3-2 victory against the Penguins. So, okay, since that 30th win against the Hurricanes, we are 6-4-1 and in our last 11 games, bringing our record to 36-23-2. The first time that we faced the Kings, they're right with us in the Pacific Division. They are in third, just four points behind with three games in hand. They're 33-21-4. So Dano and Roy hosting their old team as Connor Garland comes back to the team that traded him. Here we go, in Vancouver. We play LA again in a couple games. Let's see, the first of a little two-game series that we'll see over the next week. First period, starts off 2-1 Canucks. Beauvillier opens it up, but of course Garland scores on the power play. Thankfully, Kuzmenko answers back, and it's 2-1 Vancouver after 20. Second period, 5-2, how do you like that? Pedersen, Kessel, and Besser scoring, and Lewis scoring one for the Kings to make it 5-2. 27-17, to the shots in our favor through 40 minutes. Kings power play killed off, and that's a sixth goal now as Beauvillier makes it 6-2. to It's a four-goal lead. A very nice statement victory against a Pacific Division rival, and a team that we traded with earlier on in the season. Power play LA, that's killed off, we'll call it there. 6-2 the final, shots end pretty close, 33-31. to Three stars in this one, Beauvillier scores twice, Pedersen a goal and an assist, and the cap Captain logs three apples. You love to see it. So well, let's sim through the game against the Ducks and go to see the Kings again, this time in Los Angeles. So some important Pacific Division games here as we lose 2-1 to one on the road to the Ducks. Eh, that's tough. But now on the road against the Kings. Let's go now. The last couple of games before the trade deadline. First period, 3-1 Vancouver, picking up where we left off. Goals in the bottom six here. Studnika and Suter. Fiala for the Kings. Then JT Miller with one second left in the first period. Love it. 
Second period, three to two. Arvidsson scores the lone goal of that frame. Shots are 24 to 23 in our favor. We're up by one. Make it up by two, thanks to Pud Colson, one of his few goals this season. We're up by two, five minutes into the third period. Out shooting the Kings like last game, but where the gap is getting a little bit larger. The gap ended by just a couple shots last game. Currently ahead by about six shots. Now down to four. Final couple minutes, still up by two, and that'll end with a 4-2 victory. Shots end 35 to 34. The Kings came back, but the Smith stood tall, gets first star honors, put Colson with a goal and an assist. Studnika with a goal. I'm very happy that we're able to find ice time for Studnika, especially. Let's sim through the game against the Vegas Golden Knights, and we'll stop right before the trade deadline. Uh, Carrier for a fourth and a seventh. That's actually not bad. That is not bad. I don't even want to revisit that. I want to look at this right now. Hold on. Alexandre Carrier for a fourth and a seventh. Right-handed offensive defenseman, 27, expiring deal at 2.5 million. Buried, only played one game this season. Whoa. I guess they just, they need to move a defenseman, I suppose, here in Nashville. One, two, three, four, five, six. They don't need to, but they wouldn't mind as Shen, Barry, they're all on the block here. Carrier wouldn't be a horrible piece to pick up here. I'm just not sure if he really has anywhere to play in the lineup right now. He might have a spot in the lineup next season, but right now, I'm not really sure where he fits. Already Myers and Pullman aren't fitting, so Hughes and Ronick aren't moving. Roy is not moving. Maybe if Susie fell apart, he would come out of the lineup, but I don't think Edler or uh, Chatfield are really moving either. Chatfield, what's he up to here with the Canucks so far? He has two goals and a negative one through 23 games. Not bad compared to the negative double digits of some other players that we were starting to see. So I'm not sure if he'd fit. I'm going to go ahead and pass for the moment heading into the trade deadline. It's just a couple days from now. But I will pose the question with this like screenshot to the on-call assistant general managers over on the Discord server. If you ever want to add your live thoughts to a question that I have while recording, make sure that you're a member of our Discord server. The link for that is in the description. So we'll get back to that in a few minutes and then a 5-2 win against Vegas, beautiful. So coming into the trade deadline, we are 39, 24, and two, still sitting atop the Pacific Division. The Oilers, the Kings, they still have three, four games in hand, but we're starting to have a little bit of a larger gap as we've been on a great pace so far in the second half. So that being said, I am now going to do my due diligence and scroll through all the trade blocks in the NHL. We really don't have a lot of trade value to play with, so I'm, I would be shocked if we make a move, but I will just double check and see if there's anything that really stands out. Alrighty, so I looked through all the trade blocks in the NHL, and honestly, there are some players that are tempting. Most of those players are the same ones we saw at the beginning of the season. Guys like Perron, guys like Eberle, 83, 84, 85 overall guys who would be the type of player that you acquire if you're going on a push. But the thing is, if we were to acquire one of those players, it would mean someone in our lineup getting pushed out. And this lineup has been firing on all cylinders. We were on pace to win 46 games. Now we've already won 39, and there's, what, 17 games left to go in the season. And we only need to win seven more to reach that pace. So we've been doing very well in this second half. Kuzmenko's leading the way. Hughes has really woken up. He's up to 40 points now. He's had a big second half so far. Beauvillier at 38 and 20 goals. Hoaglander at 30 points. Matt Roy looking good. Pud Colson from 3 points in 40 games to now 15 points in 63 games. He scored 12 points in the last 20-some games. Okay, okay. Uh, the only thing really concerning me is the sustainability. Like Studnika, for example, 12 points in 29 games. That's incredible. Great job, buddy. Keep it up. But if we go into the postseason and he's our third line centerman, can we fully trust him? So in theory, you'd say, okay, go get a third line centerman. But we'd be pushing out Studnika, who's been showing great flashes of brilliance, who still has some potential to grow. And it would mean paying picks to acquire somebody when even though the overall is not great, the performance is there. So I'm leaning towards saying, I don't think there's any moves to make here at the deadline. We have some depth in our lineup already. If anything, maybe we sign a depth forward, but on defense, we're pretty much set. If Myers or if Pullman needs to come into the lineup, that's okay. In the AHL, we could call up a guy like Di Giuseppe, though. I don't think we really need to sign anybody. 
Amon or even Dakota Joshua. We could call up one of those guys. I don't think we actually need to go out and sign any depth forwards, any like 79 overall guy when we already have someone in our system who's 78, let's say, and is a proven entity. So I would say I think we stand packed. In terms of the Alexandre Carrier offer from the Predators, the Discord server says no on that. Interesting, but many people just saying no, no, we don't need him. So thank you to all the AGMs who were able to answer quickly. So we'll just sim through the trade deadline. No moves to make for us. By the way, I just looked at the, at the stats and it reminded me that we are 10 games away from Alex Edler's uh, 1,000th game as a Vancouver Canuck. Big deal here as the Kraken acquire a first and Nolan foot from the Devils for Yanni Gourd, Adam Larson, and Pierre-Edouard Benmar. So how about that for a big deal? Any other big deals around the NHL? Petrie and Sprong to the Rangers, Monaghan, Chris White. Whoa! Hold on. Sean Monaghan, Chris Weidman, and two other pieces. You would think prospects. Traded to the Bruins for Jeremy Swayman, a third and a fourth. Wow, Swayman, new starting goalie of the Canadians. Sheesh. Uh, Ian Cole to the Avalanche. Lysel to the Ducks in a deal that gives Boston Heinen, Labushkin. So the Bruins are going all in. Nick Paul going to the Sharks as Duclair goes to the Lightning. Arvidsson to the Islanders. Varlamov to the Kings. Spencer Knight to the Seattle Kraken. Dumoulin to the Panthers. Trevor Moore to the Coyotes. Shoo, so some big moves around the NHL this trade deadline, that's for sure. No moves necessary on our part. I'm very happy with this squad as we've been especially moving through this second half. Let's keep on simulating. You know what? Let's go see the Canadians. Let's go see Jeremy Swayman and the Canadians. Ah, no, they have a losing record. Let's go see... We already saw the Kings. Let's go see the Dallas Stars. They're right behind us in the Western Conference. Zaboral on, the, on waivers. 78 overall. 1.14 million. Shoo. I'd be tempted, because on the left side, we don't have anybody. It's just the right side, where we have Myers and Pullman. On the left side, Zaboral. Not a horrible guy to throw in there. So, you know what? Why not? Zaboral, I'm going to throw you in there, even though you'll likely not play at all this season. Maybe there's a spot for you as depth next season. 3-2 win against the Jets in a shootout. 4-0 shutout. How about that? Ooh, no! We shut out the, the Avalanche for nothing. Oh no, Elias Pettersson, even an injury in the AHL? What happened here? Oh wait, it's the other Elias Pettersson! Ah, it's the other Elias Pettersson! Oh, we got lucky! Oh, save the heart attack! Zaboral can come, actually no, I want Yermo in the lineup. Woo! Wow, that, oh, that was scary. It wasn't a super long-term injury, but whoo -hoo, wow. Actually, it wasn't. Ah, oh, it was. Uh, it's March nineteenth. It's only to March twenty-first. Oh, okay, but still, just to say, woo! <laughs> While we're here, let's go see Buffalo, our good old nineteen seventy expansion brother. It's Thirty-seven, twenty-nine, and three are the Sabers. They're doing very well over in the Eastern Conference. We are hosting them here at, with forty-two wins in our record. First period, we're up. Oh, we're tied one-one. Excuse me, heroic scoring for us. Second period, two-one Buffalo as JJ Paterka puts the Sabers up. Speaking of heroic, oh my goodness, I totally forgot that we have to extend him. JT Miller scores on the power play, then Olafson answers right back. Power play Canucks in the third period, but then Quinn scores right as it expires. We're down by two. Sabres on the power play again. Final 10 minutes, down by two. Not insurmountable. It's the worst lead in hockey. Let's cut into it with five minutes to go. Let's get something. There you go, Kuzmenko. Thank you. Down by one with three minutes to go. We still got some momentum in our favor. Final minute. Ah, oh, and the Bruins, the Bruins, the Sabres hang on. Shots end 34 to 33, but we drop it four to three, unfortunate. Pedersen with three assists, Kuzmenko and Hronik. Three stars all from Vancouver, but we drop it four to three. Very unfortunate. So I totally forgot about Philip Peronik. We had to extend him at the beginning of the episode. Ah, oh, the trade's got in my way. So I assume now that he wants way more because he's been on a great pace. Uh, yeah, he wants six years, eight million. Oh, man. The good news is twofold. Twofold. Number one... Heronic is an RFA, so we don't need to feel pressured to sign him. We can qualify him and get him for a bit cheaper in the offseason. Number two, you know what? It's honestly probably realistic. Heronic's an 86 overall, playing top pair minutes. He's scoring, he's on a career pace right now. 47 points at the moment. He wouldn't sign for like 5.5. It makes sense that he was asking for 8, and it'll make sense that we end up signing him for like 6.5, 6.75, something in that arena. So I'm not going to cave and sign him for 8, but I will qualify qualify him in the offseason and wait until we can get him for a little bit cheaper. Matt Wah, speaking of contract extensions, what would he be wanting? Four years of five. Could we do three? I could do three years on Matt Wah. I wouldn't mind three years on him. 
34 wouldn't be bad either. It gets him to 33. That's the thing in EA land. With defensemen costing so much in later years, I wouldn't mind signing him for four years with the understanding that he wouldn't likely or possibly be here for all four of those years. Because 85% of that is 4.29. So four years at 4.3 with the understanding that we can move him if and when needed. 4.3 million for a top four defenseman is not too shabby, I have to say. I don't think that's horrible. If we need to move him for whatever reason, we can call it a sign and trade. But I would say let's go in on Matt Roy right now. While before, let's say we make the postseason, we go further and he starts wanting more. Four years of 4.3 is not crazy for a top four defenseman. So I'm going to say let's sign him or offer the extension and we'll see what happens. Worst case, we don't keep him for that price. Beauvillier wants one year at three million, and it goes up from there. I can't sign too many. I can't extend everybody right now because our money situation will be very different come uh, the off season. So, all right, good to keep in mind. What we'll do now is go and see the Vegas Golden Knights in a couple of weeks, as that will be Alex Edler's one thousandth game as a Vancouver Canuck. Pedersen healthy down in the AHL, great. Back to the calendar now, and Matt Hua says it was an easy decision to renew the contract. Alrighty, so who knows what will happen, but we have him signed potentially at that cap hit until the ne for the next four seasons. Come on. All right, so what happened then? Ooh, 5-1 loss, 5-1 loss, followed by a 4-1 win, 5-2 win. All right, 44 wins on the season. One more game, game number 998, and 4-1 oh, loss, 999, and now game number 1,000 for Alex Edler. It will be in Las Vegas against the Golden Knights for his 1,000th game as a Vancouver Canuck. Thank you for everything, Alex Edler. You're a gem. Can't wait to see you back at home in Vancouver. Give you the golden stick and all that good stuff. Let's go out there and win it for Edler. First period, 2-2 two -two after 20. Theodore, Besser, McNabb, Dano going back and forth. Doubling their shots. Second period, 3-3. Three -three. Carlson and Kuzmenko. Shots now 27-25 to for Vegas. Big period for Vegas. But we're hanging on. 3-3 three -three game through 40 minutes. It's a final period to decide it now. Alex Edler, come on! Stone makes it 4-3 for the Golden Knights. Let's go. We got to answer back. Power play opportunity to do just that. Killed off by Vegas. We're leading the shots. Final five minutes. Hoaglander ties it up. Thank you, Niels. Thank you, Niels, with final three minutes to go. It's tied at four. Will we see overtime? Yes, we will. Shots end 40 to 34 in our favor, but we're all tied up at four for Alex Edler's thousandth game. Here at T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas. Let's see if we can get this win for Edler. Let's go, boys. Max just so broken up by Hughes. Very well done. Elias Pedersen now two on one back the other way with Kuzmenko with Max so on his back using that speed. One timer and Hill slides across to make the save. I'm sure you just noticed when I just said that. One timer, there was a bit of a crack in the microphone. I gotta get used to not shouting as much as I usually do with the new microphone that I have. A bit more sensitive. Gotta be careful there. Eichel, nice move as he gets through. Oh my goodness, what a goal to win in overtime. Wow. Wow. Jack Eichel with a beautiful goal to win it for Vegas. We still get the point, but oh my goodness. Jack Eichel puts Quinn Hughes in the turnstile. Backhand, forehand on Demko. <laughs> wow, that's a bad look right there. <laughs> Gotta give it to him. Nice goal. So the shots end 41 to 35 in our favor in that 5 4 overtime loss. Bit of a slower pace since we stopped around the deadline. Not ideal. I really want to make sure we crack 46 47 wins to break the pace that we were on. So we'll go another week and a half or so. Let's go see the Edmonton Oilers in Edmonton. 5 3 win on the road against the Coyotes. Very good. On the road, we lose 6 2 to the Kings. 3 2 shootout loss, then a big 1 0 win. 46 wins. There was our pace in the first half of the season. Any more wins in the next three games would make it a better pace, so I'd love to see at least one, if not two or three wins, to end off the season and get closer to 50, although we won't get there. Coming off a big shutout against the Coyotes. First period, four. Kuzmenko opens it up, but then McDavid, Kane, McDavid again, Dreisaitl. Four goals on 12 shots, two coming on the power play. Lovely. 5-2, DeSmith now in. A third power play goal. Just keep taking those penalties. Hoaglander scores one. We're down by three here in the third period. <sighs> okay, call it. Eight for the final. Amazing. Amazing. Hoaglander scores again. At least there's that. Eight to four. Hoaglander two goals plus two. Meanwhile, Lafferty, Hughes, Kessel, Suter, negative twos, and a lot of negative ones out there. Amazing. Four goals on each goalie. 
All right, 8-4 loss. Let's go to the last game of the season then at this point. Let's see if we can win against the Flames at home. And we lose 2-1 to one in the shootout. So our pace after the deadline was not ideal. I wouldn't say we're limping into the postseason, but I haven't been impressed with our pace after the after the deadline. Let's end off the year with this game in Winnipeg. 46-30-5 is our record. Let's try and get that 47th win to break what our pace was going to be in terms of the win column. First period, 1-0. Thank you, JT Miller, on the power play. Second period, 1-1 as Pionk ties it up. Shots are 21-15 in our favor, but Nemesnikov puts the the uh, the Jets ahead now as we're down by one as we have not had the greatest end to the season thank you Elias Elias Pedersen ties it up at two then Shifley comes right back oh I, I last game I wanted to check the penalty minutes I forgot to do that I bet if you go back in the video you can see them in the game log and a power play goal at all oh, thank you okay I was ready to give up I was ready to give up Dano scores, and then Pedersen gets his second of the period with a minute 52 to go, and we are tied up at four, headed into overtime. Shots 32 to 31 in our favor, and at the very least, we get another point as we make it to overtime. So the boys came through in the end as GM Data was ready to call it a night. Overtime three on three solves nothing. Shootout! We take it! Quinn Hughes with the winner. The captain wins it in the shootout, and we get win number 47. Let's go! Pedersen with two goals and an assist. That Those two goals coming in the third period. Huge. Thank you so much, Elias. All right, so we end the season officially with a record of 47-30-5. However, if you look at before the deadline and after the deadline, starting at the halfway point when we made those changes, in the 25 games from the halfway point to the to and including the trade deadline, in those 25 games, we went 17-7-1. After the deadline, starting at the Avalanche game and going all the way to the end of the season, in those 16 games, we went 7, 6, and 3. So, 17, 7, and 1, then 7, 6, and 3. Still a winning record, but in those 16 games after the deadline, we had only one less regulation loss in nine less games. So, not ideal. I'm not going to complain too, too much. I'm still happy with a 47, 30, and 5 record. Very happy, actually. But I was hoping that we would have gotten to 50, and it just leaves a bit of a sour taste when we were so close to doing so, and it was just a weak end after the deadline. I don't know what it was, but hey, we're in the postseason. We move forward from here. 47 wins, by the way, would be the sixth most wins in Canucks history, so we'll take it. We'll definitely take it. Looking at the points now, we only had one point-per-game player in Andre Kuzmenko, who scored 82 points in 82 games here in his sophomore season. I will say, pretty much everyone playing 82 games, not enough injuries this year. I know I shouldn't be complaining, but for realism's purposes, or probably increase the slider a little bit for next season. Sometimes with the slider being at what it is, what I have right now, we could have all kinds of injuries. This season we didn't. We'll increase just a little bit for next year. Hopefully it doesn't really hurt us too badly, but it'll be realistic to see a bit more injuries than nothing, right? So 82 and 82 for Kuzmenko, 33 goals and 75 points from Elias Pettersson. Definitely a step back from 102 points, but better than the 68 in 80 the year before that. So we'll still take 75 points from Elias. Brock Besser, 67 points. He was on pace to hit 68. 67 is still perfectly fine with me. New career high in goals and in points. Thank you very much. Brock Besser is back, baby. Love, 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 love to see that. JT Miller, big step back, honestly, but I'm going to excuse it due to relegating him to the second line. 60 points in 82 games is not horrible, but it's not what we really expect from him. Shooting percentage is down. Power play points, definitely down. Ice time also down. So I'm going to try and hope that when we get him back on the first line with the plus five in the future, in the ideal world, this will just be a one-year hiccup type of thing. Put him back with Pedersen and with Besser or Kuzmenko on the first line, and it'll be a different story. Philip Dano ended the season with 56 points. That was a negative 20. So I think it was, what, a negative 11 in the first half, now a negative 9 in the second half. So still not the greatest plus minuses, but 56 points is a new career high for him. So he is definitely enjoying life as a second line centerman, playing 18-20 here, which was not what he would have gotten in LA in 2023-24 when he was playing third line and second unit power play. Now he gets second line, second power play, first penalty kill, 
and his ice time is equal to what it was last year and much more than what it would have been this year. So great to see it from Dano. Quinn Hughes really turned it around. 56 points from him. Still not as much as we've seen him put up in franchise mode, but he had a strong second half. Hironic, 54 points from him. Career high. Great first full season here with the Canucks. Love it. Anthony Beauvillier, 23 goals and 44 points. I'm content with that. However, it does mean that he'll be wanting more now. New career high for him as well. I don't want to sign him for big money unless he's going to be a big player. If he's going to be a lock in our top six, then sure, I'll pay him his 3.5, his 4 million. But I was hoping to get him for closer to three. There's the risk. Do we sign him when he's lower at the start of the franchise mode or do we wait now? We waited, which was more realistic, but now it's going to cost us a bit more because he's been doing well, which is a good thing, but still. Checking out Hoaglander and Podkolzin now. Hoaglander ended with 20 goals and 37 points. New career highs from him. Very nice to see him able to flourish a little bit with that ice time. 11.25 per night. Very good in a full season. I like to see it. Podkolzin now, 25 points from him. He had scored three points in 39 games. Now he, once he got bumped up to the third line, he scored 22 points in 41 games. So a much better pace, a 44 point pace over a full season. He's up to an 81 overall, as I said. So very, very good to see. Career highs, of course. Not quite matching what he did in his rookie season when he scored 26 points, but actually the ice time was identical, 1248 to 1248. He played just 13 more minutes this season than in his rookie season, but a lot of the season, as we said, started off on the fourth line, and he was on a 44-point pace in the second half. So great to see from our two young players who we want to see the most growth from. Matt Watt ended with 22 points and as a plus 7, very good. Lafferty, 18 points, Suter, 16. Studnika, 14 points points in 46 games on pace for almost 30. I'll take that as a third line centerman, a plus 10 as well. Yeah, you know what? I hope that he can stay as solid as he's been as a third line center in the postseason now. Susie, 14 points. Edler, 12 points in 82 games. He got to play his thousandth as a Canuck as well. Great to see. Phil the Thrill Kessel, five goals and seven points as a negative six, unfortunately, though, on the fourth line. Still continues his Ironman streak. Myers in 41 games. He had scored seven points as well as a negative nine. Chatfield. So let's check out his numbers since we picked him up. We could think about swapping him to the top pair. I didn't really make any changes towards the end of the season because I didn't want to tinker too, too much. In 41 games, he scored two goals and was a negative six. So that is better than Myers being a negative nine in his 41 game experience. Not ideal to see him as a negative player, but I think it's a it's a larger problem than just Chatfield. But we could experiment moving some of these guys around. Like we said, Chatfield and Susie on the second pair would give it a plus two, so we can think about that in the postseason. Now, over to the goaltending. Thatcher Demko ends the year. Wow, nice. 36, 25, and 4 with 6 shutouts. 913 save percentage and 2.91 goals against average. That's par for the course in EA land, in the EA verse. Casey the Smith as a backup goes 11, 9, and 1 with a 927 save percentage and 2.42 goals against average. Okay. So if we look at the entire NHL now, leading the league was Austin Matthews with 124 points. Sheesh. 64 goals from Nikita Kucherov as well to win the Rocket Richard. Wow. I even saw uh, Joe Pavelski with 101 points. Surprising to see so many 100 point plus point guys, but I will not complain. Defenseman in the NHL, Makar with 90 points. Don't see Hughes up here, unfortunately, just yet. And for goaltending, we see Demko among the top guys for wins. And if we look at minimum, let's say 40 games, minimum 50 games played, sorting by save percentage, uh, Demko would be a little bit further down, but not by too, too much. He was a good, I'd say, average to slightly above average goaltender this season. Goals against average, yeah. So not on that first page, but as soon as you start scrolling, he's right there. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Nothing crazy from Demko, but we'll take it. And for the rookie skaters, we see Connor Bedard scoring 88 points in his rookie season. Woof! Then the next one is Marco Rossi with 39. So how about that? Connor Bedard, take a bow. As always, we want to see how our old friends did. Connor Garland, 25 goals and 59 points this season with the Kings. Pretty solid season. We didn't quite have the lineup space for him, so I'm glad to see it was a win-win deal. It's unfortunate that we had to move on from Garland. I would have liked to have kept him, but it worked out for the Kings, and it worked out for us getting Dano and Roy. Then over in Carolina, we'll want to see what happened with Mikhaev, what ended up happening. 
with him in the Hurricanes. 19 points in 42 games and a negative four. So I would say he was on an improved pace. He was getting power play time as well. So his ice time was, yeah, definitely a lot higher. So Mikhaev's a lot happier. The Hurricanes are using him well. I think it's a trade that made sense for them as well. I usually do this before the player stats, but I started looking at them and got carried away. So let's go back now and look at the team stats. In the end, we win the Pacific Division and finish sixth best in the NHL. Who would have thunk that for year number one? In the Pacific, we had the Edmonton Oilers with 95, Vegas with 92. So not too, too far away, but the sixth best team in the league. And we win the Pacific Division. Doing so for the first time since 2013. 47, 30, and 5 was our record. So we had 3.01 goals for per game on average and 2.88 against not a huge margin but at least good to see that we were in the green there we're positive if we look at the power play percentage 19.1 percent good enough to be among the top eh, 10 to 12 ish or so okay not bad and the pony kill at 83.3 however more in the middle at 83.3 it looks like i don't know it's uh, maybe more like top 16 as opposed to like top 12 for the power play so neither of our special teams really stood out that could be something we look at changing in the postseason but both were passable so that's about it for what we need to look at here ladies and gentlemen we'll close it out by looking at our round number one opponent so in the 2024 postseason we will be facing the Chicago Blackhawks. Wow, what a matchup here. A lot of history between the Canucks and the Blackhawks. You got Connor Bedard as well now here in Chicago. In those like early 2010 years, the Blackhawks and the Canucks would go at it very often. Hall, Bedard, Radish on that top line. It's just Bedard carrying. Perry, Johnson, Bailey, Foligno, Blackwell, Athanasiu, Anderson, Reichel, Donato. No one, aside from Bedard and Hall, no one above an 82 overall in the entire lineup. Uh, forward lineup, that is. Defense, we have Jones as an 87, but everyone else between 77 and 82. Not ideal here either. And goaltending is Marashik at an 82 overall. So on paper, you would think that it's an easy series, but they're here for a reason, and Bedard scored 88 points, so don't put it past him. He could carry this series on his own, already up to an 88 overall. So we gotta be very careful. Uh, my apologies again on the contract extensions. I would have loved to have gotten Hironic and Beauvillier locked in at like 5.5 and 2.75 million respectively there a piece. But deep down in my heart, I know that it does add to realism that if they were having career years, they would likely want to wait and use their leverage. They don't need to sign now. They're only getting better and that's what, exactly what, the, what happened. So down in the AHL, by the way, we have a losing, very bad losing record. We're not going to be making the postseason in the AHL, but just let you know that was our record there. So far, one game left for the Abbotsford Canucks. Ladies and gentlemen, that's it for us here in year number one. Headed into the 2024 postseason, we are Pacific Division champions. We had a solid year, but there are some concerns. Do we need to go on a cup run necessarily? No, we would love it, but it's not necessarily what we need. What we really need is to see continued growth from our young players, putting them in the best positions possible, maybe upgrading our special teams, maybe our depth. The plus minus still, you know, it's still not great to see there. Do we play around with the defensive pairs at all? That's a possibility power play unit don't forget unit number one looks like this unit number two looks like this the penalty kill unit number one looks like this unit number two looks like this and unit number three looks like this so any suggestions that you may have please leave them here on youtube down in the comments or over on the discord server link in the description leave a like if you were impressed by our improved pace in the second half who would you say that our mvp is for year number one so far and of course if you haven't already be sure to be subscribed to the channel so that you don't miss out on any of our vancouver connects franchise mode uploads as well as our thursday night live streams our expansion franchise mode series with the san francisco starfleet which is also also been ongoing you don't want to miss out on that career simulations and much much more here on the channel it's a great community we're closing in on 7,000 subscribers we're almost there and it'll be that much stronger of a team with you as a part of it so i would love to see you joining in and chiming in and adding your thoughts i'll leave you there ladies and gentlemen thank you for taking the time looking forward to getting back into the postseason there's our first check mark on doing what ownership brought us in to do and now let's see how deep we can go on this run next episode in the 2024 postseason and I hope to see you there.